So a while back for my birthday, my wife wanted to buy me a present, and she almost went with an atomic clock. I guess because I'm a nerd, or she thinks I'm a nerd, which I technically am, and so she thought it would be a perfect present. But I basically told her, please don't buy it, it's not going to work here in South Korea. And she kind of laughed at this saying, why wouldn't it? It's an atomic clock, atoms here work just as well as they do in the US. And so then I basically had to explain that this is not actually an atomic clock, but instead is a radio clock. It's essentially a clock able to capture radio frequencies from various radio towers by the National Institute of Standards and Technology. And specifically here, it sends out a very simple signal in a frequency of 60 kilohertz that because of its frequency is not actually used for anything, since not a lot of information can be actually transmitted in such low frequencies. But simple bits are transmitted at all times, and these simple bits basically tell all of the clocks in the United States what time it currently is, based on the actual atomic clock that measures the most accurate time in the US in one of the NIST facilities. But these radio clocks have a very specific coverage that does not include East Asia or South Korea. And so here it would be kind of useless. And so for that birthday, um, I basically got nothing. I mean, she was actually gonna buy me something else, but I also had an explanation for why that would be a relatively bad present as well, and so she uh, got me nothing. But on a more positive note, today we're talking about atomic clocks and a really exciting proposition that might potentially help us understand quantum physics and quantum gravity just a little bit better. Which is why I wanted to start with this unusual anecdote. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, let's discuss some of these recent discoveries and some of these recent announcements, mostly because it actually shows us how far we've come now in terms of our ability to measure time and how this ridiculous accuracy now allows us to measure things at microscopic scales. And it actually starts with this announcement also published by NIST or the National Institute of Standards and Technology in regards to the study you can find in the description. Researchers at NIST and University of Colorado Boulder were able to create the most accurate atomic clock ever. Here the accuracy is referred to as systematic uncertainty and is basically the value you see right there. And just to help you understand what this means, in some sense it's kind of similar to the famous Moore's law in regards to computer power. So here over the years we expect the clock uncertainty to actually decrease as new more advanced atomic clocks are created by various sciences. And based on previous estimates, we should have basically reached 10 to the power of minus 19 frequency uncertainty sometimes in early 2020s. And well, it's early 2020s now, and it looks like we have achieved this uncertainty. And this means that this clock only loses a single second every 30 billion years, making this the most accurate device ever created by humans. But here, I guess a quick side note. In case you ever wondered how atomic clocks work, the principle here is actually really simple. Now one of the older videos in the description describes this in more detail, but in essence it's the same principle as the grandfather's clock pendulum. In a typical pendulum, every single swing is one second. And so by counting these resonations, the clock is then able to keep accurate time. Naturally though, it's not super accurate. And something similar happens in digital clocks or any electric clocks, but here the oscillations or the resonance is produced by the cycles coming from the electric grid. In the United States it's 60 Hz, in Europe and some other countries it's 50 Hz. And so here, 60 cycles per second allows this clock to measure seconds relatively accurately. But you get even more accuracy from clocks using quartz crystals. When stimulated by electricity, quartz starts to oscillate at a very specific frequency, which is usually around 33 kilohertz. And so that frequency then serves as a resonator in a lot of different clocks. But over time, even these crystals lose their accuracy and actually produce just a little bit of a deviation from, I guess, what you would call some kind of a true time. And so decades ago, someone realized that, well, we can also use atoms. Atoms also resonate, but they do so at a much higher frequency. And for many, many decades, the most common atom used was cesium-133, with the actual process being slightly more complicated and involving several steps. It essentially turns cesium into a kind of a super cold cloud of gas that's then guided by the laser down into a microwave cavity. And here this microwave cavity produces just the right frequency to turn a lot of these cesium atoms into excited cesium atoms, which tend to acquire and lose their energy at exact fraction of a second at all times. And so then by using other lasers, 
it becomes possible to see how many atoms have transformed from higher state to lower state, thus acquiring a kind of a precise measurement for what we would call a second, which by the way is actually how the second is defined. Today the unit of second is defined by that cesium frequency where the ground state transitions into the higher state with a number equal to this value in hertz. And so for many decades most of the atomic clocks used this principle of the cesium fountain. They essentially used clouds of cesium to measure the most accurate value of time. But as I showed you previously, pretty much every few years this idea or this principle improved by either using different atoms or by improving the device itself. With this new device now changing the microwaves into visible light waves, which obviously have a much higher frequency, but also replacing cesium with strontium. You can actually sort of see that laser and the gas of strontium right there in the middle. And so now by measuring even higher frequencies, it becomes possible to measure things a lot more accurately. With this clock being so precise that it can technically even now detect very tiny microscopic effects predicted by theories including general relativity. In other words, it now becomes possible to measure extremely tiny time dilation that happens at very small intervals. And that's based on the idea that Earth has gravity and you actually do experience slightly different time in different gravity wells. So for example, the GPS satellites, because they experience time a little bit differently, have to have their time always adjusted because the time for them flows a little bit different compared to the time for anything on the surface of the planet. But here we're talking about distances of thousands of kilometers. In this case, or in this particular atomic clock, it now becomes possible to measure differences visible in microns of space or even smaller, which will at some point probably lead us to an even more accurate measurement of a single second and thus a new definition, but also has so much potential application. For example, looking for various underground deposits, which can be easily seen when there are tiny deviations in gravity on Earth. Or, for theoretical physicists, this is exciting because it allows us to finally measure Einsteinian effects at microscopic levels. And so here it's not just about building a much better clock, it can also finally allow us to understand secrets of the universe by measuring things at microscopic levels. And one of the recent studies even proposes how we can potentially do this, thus possibly finally connecting the Einsteinian principles with the principles of quantum physics. Or at least find out if there are any Einsteinian principles or general relativity principles when it comes to quantum particles. And so in this new study you can find any description, researchers believe we can actually combine two separate techniques to finally start studying general relativity and quantum effects because of these new atomic clocks. And here it's all about lasers. They believe we can actually combine the lasers from the atomic clock with the lasers used in various optical tweezers which are essentially highly focused lasers that are usually used to control individual atoms, nanoparticles, or anything too small to hold with your hands. But the thing is, in extremely cold temperatures, pretty much anything starts to act as a quantum particle. And so here the researchers propose using the atom of ytterbium, which is also used in a lot of accurate atomic clocks, in order to trap it in such a way that it then starts to exhibit quantum effects. Which means that it's no longer just an atom, it becomes a quantum wave or a kind of a matter wave. And intriguingly, because of these quantum effects, it then becomes possible to use these laser tweezers or optical tweezers to not just control the particle itself, but to also control any of its superpositions where it might appear according to the quantum principles. And so in other words, what this means is that we can take one of these optical tweezers and place it on the one end of this wave, then take another optical tweezer and place it very very close at the other end of the quantum wave, and then, due to superposition principles, actually capture particles in both tweezers at the same time, but it's the same particle. It's the same particle that's in its superposition state. I mean, I know it sounds kind of ridiculous and kind of counterintuitive, but this superposition has been proven time and time again with the superposition particle existing in both locations at the same time, with both optical tweezers being able to grab it at the same time as well. And yeah, that does sound kind of weird, but apparently has been done before. And so here, assuming we can actually do this inside an atomic clock, it then becomes possible to maybe separate these tweezers just a little bit until the superposition disappears and until measurements can be conducted. And by doing this, and specifically doing this inside the atomic clock right here on planet Earth, or essentially separating these superposition atoms vertically, we can then hypothetically 
start measuring these relativistic effects. So just like those satellites in space, technically, the superposition particle on the bottom should be experiencing time just a little bit different from the superposition particle on top. And because here we're talking about atomic clocks with ridiculous accuracy, this experiment would now be sensitive enough to measure tiny deviation in time because of the gravitational well of planet Earth. And so just like the clock in space that runs just a little bit slower than the clock on Earth, we expect the superposition atom on top to be just a little bit slower than the superposition atom on the bottom. Here they actually refer to this as a kind of a quantum version of the Einstein's twin paradox. Except that here the twins are the same atom held by optical tweezers or lasers and are basically atoms but in slightly different locations. And though the simpler version of this experiment has already been tried, the version involving complex atomic clocks has not been done yet. But if conducted, this would actually help us answer one simple question. Does gravity, and specifically relativistic effects, affect quantum particles? Because here, even though I explained to you that it should affect them, we don't really know what's going to happen. We don't know if these superposition particles would feel anything, and if the time in the top particle would be different from the bottom one. Since it's the same atom, maybe there's no difference, and maybe they actually don't care about Einsteinian principles at all. And though similar experiments have been conducted relatively recently, so far the accuracy was just not high enough to determine what's happening. But in the next two or three years, because of the advances in the atomic clocks, we might be finally able to answer some of these questions. And this could then possibly take us just a little bit closer in helping us connect the Einsteinian principles with quantum mechanics, and thus see if the quantum states can be affected by gravity at all. It's a very important question in theoretical physics, it might actually lead us to the breakthrough in quantum gravity, and will very likely have a lot of far-reaching implications in terms of various sensing technologies, and of course technologies involving time, and possibly a lot more. Honestly, at this point, I don't think we can predict where all of this leads, but these are important questions in physics, and at some point someone should be able to answer them. At the moment though, we don't really have any answers, and these are just theoretical propositions based on the advances in atomic clocks. And so once we do have concrete answers, we'll come back and talk more about this in some of the future videos, and of course discuss the implications. Until then, thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership, or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye.